Welcome to Discovering Orthodox Christianity. I'm Stacy Spanos, your host for this series of programs designed to explain the basic teachings of Orthodox Christianity. We're honored to be filming at the beautiful Holy Cross Chapel on the campus of Helena College, Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in Boston. In today's program, we'll discuss Orthodoxy and other faith traditions. We're honored to have with us today His Eminence, Metropolitan Methodios of Boston, co-chair of the Orthodox Catholic Consultation in the United States, and also Reverend Dr. Dimitrios Donyas. He is pastor of Taxiarchi Greek Orthodox Church in Watertown, Massachusetts, and also ecumenical officer for the Metropolis of Boston. Metropolitan Methodios and Father Donyas serve on interfaith organizations within the Boston area. Thank you both for being here with us today. Our pleasure. Your Eminence, let's begin with you and ask you the question, how does the Orthodox Church view the other Christian churches? Do they have truth as well? <clears throat> well, we believe that the Orthodox Church has the fullness of truth, but we cannot say that the Holy Spirit, uh, we cannot confine the Holy Spirit uh, to the Orthodox Church. We believe that the, there is uh, truth to be found in every human heart. And uh, that's why the ecumenical movement is important for the Orthodox Church, because we reach out to everyone. A lot of people question, Father Donyas, whether people of other faiths, not necessarily those of Christian faith, go to heaven. What is the Orthodox view on that? Well, the Orthodox Church views the Church as the Ark of Salvation, and that that is the straight path to salvation. Um, but however, as His Eminence mentioned, um, orthodoxy is always very careful not to confine the activity of God. And so, you know, sometimes you hear the, the church as is compared to the Ark of Salvation, that we find salvation by being in that, that boat. But that's not to preclude God from saving others. That's up to, to him to decide. And so how the eschaton, how the end times plays out is the decision of God. And God is the one who renders that judgment, the last judgment, not man before that event. Your Eminence, the Orthodox Church appears to have a pretty good inroads with <coughs> other faiths, very open dialogue. In fact, you're very mm -hmm. instrumental in that. Tell us how. Well, personally, I'm involved with the Orthodox uh, Roman Catholic dialogue in the United States. Here in Boston, I've always developed, uh, since I came in 1984, a very close relationship, especially with the Roman Catholic Church. And that uh, relationship has developed uh, both with Cardinal Law and now with Cardinal O'Malley. We, I consider them brothers in Christ. Uh, we uh, meet several times a year. I attend the uh, Catholic ceremonies at the Cathedral of the Holy Cross on Holy Week. I invite the Cardinal to the Cathedral of the Annunciation on Easter night. Uh, we exchange uh, visits uh, on the Feast of St. Andrew and the Feast of St. Peter and Paul. And uh, that relationship has, has uh, uh, as I said, developed over the years to a very, very tight relationship. And, uh, Why is that relationship important, Your Eminence? Because we like, we, both of us want to manifest the, the uh, love of God in the community, the fact that the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church were one for the first 10 centuries in our history. And uh, I believe if, uh, that the Catholic Orthodox dialogue is really the one that, that brings those two major churches together. The other dialogues with the other Protestant churches are not as fruitful because of the obvious theological differences that, that exist. How about reaching out to people of other faiths? Um, some of the same benefits are, are realized as in our inter-Christian uh, dialogue. I'm involved uh, quite a bit with the, the Jewish-Christian uh, dialogue, and there we find ma very many cognate points, especially in terms of spirituality, some of the common social ethical uh, concerns that both of our faiths uh, share. And so there's much fruit to be uh, garnered from those, uh, those relationships, especially speaking within the Jewish context. Uh, we have two faiths in terms of Orthodox Christianity, which represents the early Christian expression of, of the faith, and Rabbinic Judaism, both of which emerged out of the ruins of the Second Temple into the first centuries of uh, the first uh, millennium. And so we find so many commonalities, some point, so many points of commonality between the two uh, faiths in terms of our shared inheritance and shared history that there's great fruit for discussion there. In terms of the broader interreligious um, dialogue, 
especially in terms of, as I mentioned before, spirituality, um, the role of religion in an increasingly secular world. These are areas where we have uh, great common interests <coughs> and it would be irresponsible for us not to have a uh, discussion since we're, we're sharing the same planet. Your Eminence, have there been any significant breakthroughs because of such dialogue? Well, this year, for example, we had uh, dialogue with the uh, Jewish community and the Muslim community, and uh, we were able to uh, cooperate on issues of definition of marriage. For example, the uh, physician-assisted suicide issue here in Massachusetts. And the Christian community and the Jewish community and the Muslim community uh, came together and uh, uh, manifested our beliefs of the three major faiths. Uh, to, the, to the governor and to the legislature. And that is quite an accomplishment, considering that many of the Orthodox churches can't agree amongst themselves. On many issues, yes, but uh, on, on these major uh, issues, as Father uh, mentioned before, uh, we come together as, as an Orthodox church as well. Let's talk about something that's quite personal to the both of you, and that is what happened in Boston in 2013, just a few short months ago from when we're taping here. Your Eminence, do you find that people of other faiths sought out comfort from you? Because I know that you made yourself available. Well, I participated in the ecumenical uh, service at the Cathedral of the Holy Cross. Uh, at, uh, the president uh, also uh, appeared. Uh, following that service and for several weeks after, many people would stop me on the street and uh, seek my, uh, my, my advice, my spiritual advice. Uh, it was a terrible time for Boston and for Watertown where Father is the pastor. Uh, people were wounded, not only physically, we, hundreds of, of, of people were wounded, lost legs and arms, and uh, we didn't want them to lose hope in life. And they approached the Roman Catholics, they, they, they approached the Protestants, and they approached the Orthodox bishop who was available and to them. Uh, pardon me for interrupting. That is appropriate for us to offer blessings to people who may not be of our faith? Of course, you're, you're conveying the love of God to people, and uh, I think you do that to everyone. Everyone is created in God's image and likeness, and you know whether he's a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim who's a victim of a tragedy like this, you embrace them with God's love. Father Watertown was the scene of the tragic shootout between the, the suspects and police. Uh, your parishioners live in that area. You live and work in that area. What was that like for you? Um, in many cases, it was surreal. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to see your church in many of the, the shots because all of the activity took place in that area. But you really saw a bond between, you know, if we're within the context of this discussion of inter-Christian, interfaith uh, dialogue, um, outreach from all the different uh, religious groups that were there, all the different churches that were expressing their support, their sympathy. I know all of the colleagues that I have in the ecumenical uh, dialogue, I mean, my phone was going off the, the hook, not from, you know, my brother Orthodox priests alone, although they did call as well to see how things were going, but from, uh, from the Jewish communities, from the Catholic community, uh, and it shows how, how these relationships can really begin to bring us together uh, in a way that we're called to be brought together. Um, I, when His Eminence came, we were blessed to have His Eminence come the, um, the Sunday right afterwards, and He came to, to be with the community because you know, many of our, uh, our parishioners were, were caught in the crossfire. The, thank God no one was hurt, but their, their homes, their cars, some of their cars, their windows were blown out. They had uh, bullet holes through their bedroom uh, uh, windows. And his eminence was there to just to reach out to them. But as, as he mentioned, as we were taking a tour of, of the scene, random people are coming up and asking, asking for a blessing. And they were, they were, they were drawn to the presence of, of his eminence. And that's, I think that's a beautiful thing. Because as, as he mentioned, we're called to pray for all of creation. We do that in the, the divine liturgy. You know. I'm reminded of that poignant picture showing Archbishop Dimitrios at the site of the Twin Towers days mm -hmm. later giving blessings to the firefighters there. And I don't know if there are any photographs of mm -hmm. your eminence doing the same for the police officers. It doesn't matter. No, it doesn't, no, it doesn't. The other two weeks ago, we had the blessing of having Archbishop uh, of Athens here, Hieronymus, uh, and we took him to the, to the uh, Boylston Street where this tragedy took place. And we, there were about six or eight of us with robes and orthodox uh, uh, garments. 
and the, the, the people gathered around us, and we offered a prayer at that time, and people were interested in, 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 in the Orthodox Church. This is what we do. We, we try to manifest the orthodoxy in, in the community in which we live. Father, some people might say, well, why should the Orthodox faith reach out to Muslims or Jews? What would you say to them? Um, you know, we're always called to put the lamp on the lampstand, uh, not, uh, not under the bushel. Um, I can give you a, a personal example. I, I gave a, a paper in Constantinople at a World Council of Churches event, which was understanding Christianity with the context of Judaism. Um, and there was a particular scholar there who I met a year later, and she was offering a presentation. And I, and I can tell you that she, she reproduced almost verbatim parts of my uh, paper in which I talked about the references to the, uh, the Old Testament that are in Orthodox uh, liturgy, especially in the sacrament of, of matrimony, which was something that she was talking about. Um, and so that's a witness that I don't think this, this particular theologian and scholar would have had outside of our presence in the dialogue. Now, it's a very small example, but um, unfortunately, because of his, historical circumstances, either through um, occupation during the Ottoman years or through communist rule where many of the Orthodox countries were, were subjugated, it's been difficult for many people to access the fruits of Orthodoxy, which are the fruits of the early church. And so uh, it's, it's not simply an opportunity for us, but I think a responsibility for us to, to give the joy that is the historic church to, to a world that sometimes is very unfamiliar with it. And that includes those of other uh, religions. Your Eminence, is it okay for an Orthodox to marry, an Orthodox Christian to marry somebody who is not Christian? Uh, we do not permit those weddings to take place in the Orthodox Church because the Orthodox partner uh, uh, believes in Jesus Christ. And it's difficult in a marriage to, to be married to someone that is, has no such belief in Christ when you're called day by day to grow in God's image and likeness. So out of pastoral concern for uh, that couple, we don't allow that, that uh, marriage to take place in the Orthodox Church. What if a child was to result from that union and one of the parents wanted the child baptized? If, if both parents agree, the non-Christian partner agrees, we baptize the child. We don't, we don't pass on any uh, issues with, of the parents to the child. The child is uh, baptized. Father, I think the Orthodox faith has been accused of being xenophobic, xenophobia, as they say in Greek, afraid of those who are different from us in the past. Do you think that's changing over the years? Um, I don't know whether that's a particularly fair uh, assertion. Again, there's sometimes there's some historical reasons uh, for that. I think the Orthodox Church has historically, if we look especially from the patristic period uh, onward, our tradition has been to engage the world, uh, not simply to withdraw Within. If, we, if we take seriously our position as the historic church, this is the church that Christ gave, that the apostles preached and the fathers preserved and, and took that faith out into the world. This is the church that brought uh, the beauty of orthodoxy to the Slavic people, that the emissaries of Prince Vladimir came into Hagia Sophia and saw the glory that was the, the, the liturgy there. So I don't know if that's really historically a fair assertion. Um, sometimes that perception has been because, you know, in the United States in particular, we have been uh, an uh, immigrant church. And so, I mean, all those trappings come along, not only with Orthodoxy, but in, within the Catholic churches. We see you had Irish churches and, and Spanish churches and, and Italian churches uh, that had their own, that ministered to their own people like that. But I don't think that's so much uh, historically uh, mm -hmm. xenophobia within uh, Orthodoxy, and certainly is not part and parcel of our tradition. And certainly the Comenical Patriarchate has always reached out uh, to encyclicals in the early 1900s, uh, encouraging the creation of the, what is now the World Council of Churches. Mm -hmm. And we followed the, that example of the Patriarchate. I, here on the campus of the school, we have Patriarch Athenagoras' statue, where he says, come let us look into each other's eyes. This is what orthodoxy, this is the message of orthodoxy. Come let us look into each other's eyes and into each other's souls. So we're not xenophobic. Your Eminence, we, with all due respect, we say this from the comfort of America here where things are relatively peaceful, but even my mother's generation is mistrustful of, because of the Ottoman Empire, 
that overwhelmed Greece and many of the countries in that region for, for many years. What do you say to people who still bring up that argument because you, your evidence knows there are many? Against the Muslims, what happened at the hands of the Muslims? Well, you know, we, uh, times hopefully are changing, hopefully through dialogue, uh, we, we are able to come together as, a, as, as God's people. Uh, fanatic Islamists don't represent the Muslim faith necessarily. Uh, yes, the, the Greek people suffered quite a lot during those years. But again, it was the ecumenical patriarchate during the um, uh, Turkish occupation for many years always reached out to other Christian groups and to the Muslim groups. Even today, there's dialogue at the Patriarchate with the, the Turkish government to open the theological school in Khalki. And hopefully, uh, the Patriarch's um, uh, dream and prayer to God will come true. I'm just reminded of Archbishop Yakovos as well, walking with Martin Luther King right. during the civil rights era. That Tell was us a, about that. Was that. A, that was a major event in the history of the Archdiocese. Uh, when the Archbishop walked in Selma, Alabama. That took a lot of courage, not only, not only to go to, that, uh, to Selma at that time, but also he faced um, quite a lot of criticism from our own Orthodox people for doing that, especially the Orthodox that lived uh, in the South. But uh, I think that that particular decision of the Archbishop uh, brought him to the, to the, uh, to the foreground of, uh, uh, of America. Father, how do other faith groups view the Orthodox Church and what it has offered historically and even in the modern age? Sure. Um, well, within the, the Roman Catholic uh, community, certainly there's identification that we are a sacramental church. Uh, there's an identification with our liturgy, with the, our, our center, our Eucharistic center of our, our services. And so there's a great deal of affinity there. Within the Protestant world, um, there is a desire, since because there's such an affinity for the text, for the biblical scriptural text, that they want to get as close to that text as possible. And so the early church fathers are very attractive to them in helping to understand how early Christians understood the Bible, which is so central to their aspect. So it depends within the Christian world of how they view orthodoxy within the prism of their own lens. Um, but unfortunately, uh, for many, it's, it's, it's um, ignorance in the sense that they're unaware, really, of orthodoxy beyond maybe the Greek festivals that they attend to or understanding as an ethnic church, um, and sometimes misplacing it either as a type of um, Roman Catholic church. I mean, sometimes we're identified with Roman Catholics and put into that part of that same communion, uh, and sometimes maybe as an Anglican church that, you know, someone who just separated and left Rome at some historical time. So I think there, there, there is from those affinity, those points of affinity, and also through um, a misunderstanding uh, or being unaware of who we are in the, the first place. And so part of the, the dialogue, part of the benefits of the dialogue and of our ecumenical movement is to make them to aware, to provide them with the opportunities to understand who the Orthodox Church is, and in that way, come in contact with the historic aspects of their own churches. Do you find you have to educate other pastors, preachers, when they come into contact with you? Certainly, certainly. And I think um, that happens at a variety uh, of, uh, of levels. It happens at an academic level. Um, you know, I know one professor was uh, commenting to me that he says, you have to understand for us, the early church begins in the 16th century. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and certainly that's, that's a focus of, of their own faith tradition, the origins of their faith tradition, and that's where you're going to do your, 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 your studying. Uh, and so there are plenty of opportunities for that. You know, heck, down at the parish level, we can even look just, you know, we're having our Grecian festival right now, and we'll be uh, conducting church tours. And anyone who's been to a Greek festival, you see the church tours are there. You can just see in the eyes of the people that they're really, in many instances, experiencing something new for the, the, the first time. And I'm sure you get plenty of questions. Have you had any converts? Oh, absolutely, you know, absolutely. And we know, you know, here in the, the seminary, uh, quite a few, I mean, this was a phenomenon of my time at the seminary, uh, that uh, many of the, the, the incoming priests are, uh, are converts to the faith. Uh, and if you ask them to a, to a person almost, what enamored you with orthodoxy? 
almost to a person, it's the early church fathers, it's the early church. I had, in, when I was at the funeral of my, my aunt in, in, in California, the man driving the limousine was a tall Midwestern type. He, had, he was asking all of these very pointed questions and he confessed, confessed that he was a catechumen in the Orthodox Church. He was converting to Orthodoxy. What had led him to Orthodoxy was the Da Vinci Code. Now that makes the no Vinci sense, code. it makes no okay. sense. But he knew it didn't make sense, but it didn't, he didn't know why. So he went online, he went to the internet, and he started reading the early church fathers. Now reading the early church fathers, you used to have to go to a library, you had to dust these things off. Now you can just do and Google it, and you find, you can go to goarch.org and find out a lot. In fact, he had gone quite a bit to our, our archdiocesan uh, website. And he became Orthodox because of that. Because uh, of, so we have the Da Vinci Code to thank. Uh, well, <laughs> I'd, like to thank sort of I'd like to thank Theo Nicolaikis <laughs> and Gorch a little bit more than the Da Vinci Code. But that was the ability that, that, that information is out there. Uh, and through our churches being in, through engaging the world and being in this dialogue, that's what brings the light of Orthodoxy to, to a world that really is thirsting for it. You, you mentioned converts. There, many of the students that are, that are studying here at the seminary now are converts to Orthodoxy. And you know, the, the embrace, I always say the embrace of orthodoxy is opened wide for anyone that wants to um, dialogue with Christ at the Jacob's Well of Orthodoxy, which is our local parish, which is the seminary. Uh, back when I was a student, 99.9% .9 were American born or, or students from Greece that came here at 17 years of age and matured over seven years. Now, the, the, the great majority of students come after they receive a BA from another school. Many of them are married with children. Many of them have become Orthodox and uh, are, are experiencing Orthodoxy here at the seminary and one day will become priests of the church. And how you make a convert truly an, or, an Orthodox uh, uh, a, a priest uh, is, is a long process. Uh, but we find that many of our, uh, if not most of our converts are more zealous Orthodox Christians than those of us that were born into the church. Your Eminence, what do they tell you about what causes them to convert? What makes them desire to convert? I think what, what Father said, after studying uh, uh, the fathers of the church, after studying the history of, of, of the first thousand years, many of them come quite frankly because they're disappointed in their own churches. Uh, many Protestants come to us because, or Anglicans especially, Episcopalians, because they find that the Episcopal Church, uh, in their opinion, has, has strayed away from the original Christian message. So they want to come back to Christianity, the pure Christianity of the first 10 centuries. So they come to us, and again, we open our embrace to them. Many years ago, I had a priest in Lubbock, Texas, who was a convert. Mm -hmm. And those were the same reasons he told me, is because the more he delved into the Bible and going back to the time of Jesus, he found that he felt the Orthodox faith was the one that adhered to those traditions the most. We have not changed our th basic tenets of our th theology, have not changed uh, after the, which was formulated during the seven ecumenical councils and through the writings of the, of the fathers of the church, that, that faith has not wavered. And when you belong to another, uh, to a, a Protestant, if you will, uh, denomination where things change on a weekly basis, there, there are about 600 different Protestant denominations where you have 600 different views on, on the Bible view, and views of holy tradition. So many of those converts come to us because they find a stability in the Orthodox message. Father, can we as Orthodox attend other Christian churches? Or can we participate in their sacraments? For example, can we take communion in the Catholic Church? Uh, the answer to that question is, is no. Uh, and the reason why you can attend, well, there's, there's a two-part question. The first question would be yes. Certainly, I mean, our hierarchs is uh, All Holiness Patriarch Bartholomew was at uh, the uh, enthronement of Pope Francis uh, recently. Um, so certainly attendance and respectful attendance uh, is, has been part of the tradition uh, forever. Uh, however, uh, participation in the sacraments implies that we are in communion, and communion for the Orthodox means that we share the same faith. So it would be disrespectful, both of our own and for the other, uh, the other faith, 
to imply that we share that same faith when there are serious substantive theological differences that separate us. And the fact that we are not in communion with uh, our Christian, with many Christian uh, brethren, is uh, a signal of the work that needs to be done still to restore that common faith. And that is the marker for communion. It's not simply an organizational thing that we're in the same administrative structure, but rather that we all believe the same things. And all of us, Orthodox included, are always striving for authentic Christianity. And so in that way, you know, we use the term you know, previously about converts. It's, it's, it's appropriate, but we can almost say that rather than converting from the Orthodox perspective, they're completing who they are by filling in that missing gap of those first centuries, those first thousand years, if you will, plus for many of, of, the, of the church. And so that's why, unfortunately, the sacramental life is not something that can be shared because it is, bears witness to the, the differences in belief. And therefore, I assume other Christians cannot partake in our sacraments, in our church. No, they cannot. No, they cannot. May I ask your eminence about baptism? Because I know uh, some people who want to be confirmed in the faith of the Orthodox tradition, if they have already been baptized in their denomination, right. they do not need to be rebaptized. Right. Is that correct? That's right. It is the strict policy of the Ecumenical Patriarchate not to rebaptize anyone that was baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, you have to check that. Uh, there are some denominations that they will give you a baptismal certificate that you're baptized in the name of the Holy Trinity, but we have we found that the definition of Holy Trinity for us is different sometimes than the definition given by that Protestant sect somewhere in the middle of Kansas. But if you're baptized in the name of the Holy Trinity, you are you, you are confirmed into the Orthodox Church. You are not rebaptized. And we don't rebaptize simply because we feel that they don't need to be rebaptized, or would it negate the first baptism? Or that we believe in one baptism. You're baptism. baptized once in your life. Father, you, I want to harken back to something you had just said about mending the rifts between the, Orthodox, or the Christian faiths. What do we need to work on in order to become one? Technically, we are one. Um, well, that's, that's an ambitious goal. Um, and, and, and certainly, if the divisions and separations, at least if we use that, that figure of 1054, for example, uh, where, which means many people mark the Great Schism. Historically, we can bracket that a little bit. So between Orthodoxy, Orthodoxy and, and Roman Catholicism, Catholicism, you're talking about a thousand years uh, plus of division. Uh, and so it would be, I think, I think irresponsible to think that within a couple decades, it's all going to get ironed out because you're dealing, and then within the Protestant churches, which are a product of the Reformation in the 16th century, you're speaking, and then many of them come at points after that. So you're talking about reclaiming a piece of history that's quite broad, reclaiming theological principles that are they're quite divergent. Now I know, you know, at a superficial level, for many of us, we see icon screens and incense and censors, but it goes much deeper than that. As His Eminence mentioned, what is our basic and fundamental uh, understanding of the Trinity. When you're speaking in, in, in uh, ecumenical inter-Christian dialogue with faiths that, that offer communion, but don't find the real presence in the elements of the bread and the wine, that it's really not the body of Christ, it's really not the blood of Christ. These are substantive theological differences. And to move towards, when, when we speak of communion, towards that sharing of the same faith, you know, certainly, as his eminence mentioned earlier, within the, the Catholic churches, there's much more commonality. But then again, there are still serious theological issues that present us, not simply ecclesiological issues that pertain to the role of the papacy, but, you know, the, the Immaculate Conception, um, the Sacred Heart of Jesus. I mean, all these things that are near and dear to the heart of Roman Catholics that are part of their tradition, part of the theology and faith that just simply can't be washed away, you know, even if the hierarchs, the heads of those church, even the Pope with his authority so desired, he's, he's carrying behind him, you know, at the back of the train, thousands of, of years of tradition that need to be reconciled. And so to enter into dialogue with the goal that we're going to be in intercommunion, it, it really does a disservice to the dialogue because it, it, it prohibits us from really focusing on the things that are achievable and tangible. Your Eminence, has your work in the ecumenical movement led you to get a better understanding of who you are and your Orthodox faith? It has, because it has is, it is, uh, encouraged me to study my faith, my tradition, the patristic tradition, 
And it has also led me uh, to study the traditions of the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant churches. When you're in dialogue, you have to pretty much know what, what you're talking about and be able to answer to the best of your abilities your own tradition. So I remember when I went to Boston University after I finished seminary here, I think I did more reading the first semester at BU than I did <laughs> the last two years that I was here in seminary because I didn't want to be confronted uh, with questions about orthodoxy that I could not answer. So it, it really forced me to, to study even more. And this is the case with, with the, uh, in the dialogues. Father, same with you or different experience? No, no, absolutely. I think, you know, the apologetical tradition of the church starts from day one. Uh, you had, um, when you say apologetical, what do you mean? That mean? means defending the church in terms of articulating your faith to people who don't share that faith. And so um, Justin uh, Martyr, for example, did that in terms of the predominant Roman religious cult that existed at the time. Uh, he also did it with, um, with the Jewish community. Uh, at his time. St. John Chrysostom, for example, existed in a religiously pluralistic society that was not, a, not too different from our own. You had people who were, uh, there was a vibrant Jewish community there, followers of the Roman religious cult, different types of other faiths that were there. And, and so, it, you know, a lot of our patristic tradition is involved in articulating our faith vis-a-vis -vis the other, not so much in an effort to put the other down, but to help us better understand the differences that exist and why it is that we believe that what we believe. And have you been strengthened in your faith through this dialogue? Absolutely. I mean, something that always has appealed to me is the inner harmony of orthodoxy. It really, there, it is a very consistent faith. There are no inherent inconsistencies uh, within it. And that exists, you know, historically, that exists at a spiritual level, that exists uh, theologically. And so whenever we engage in this dialogue, whenever, as his, his, his eminence mentioned, we're forced to articulate our dialogue, uh, it, I think it can only help to sort of strengthen our own faith and better help us better understand it. Again, their fathers were engaged in the same enterprise. Your eminence, I'd like to give you the final word uh, <clears throat> wrapping this up about our faith and other faith traditions. What would you say to somebody watching this clip here today? about seeking out the truth about themselves in a pluralistic world? Well, I think I would advise them to, to really study the fathers of the church and our, our church history and our traditions. And by doing so, you, you, you search within your own soul to find out where you are vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Almighty God and, 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 and your own personal struggles in, in the faith. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention before about the dialogue and what, uh, what we see as the result of the dialogue, I think Father will agree that the Roman Catholic tradition over the last 25, 30 years has looked, they have studied their own tradition and have found, uh, you mentioned the Sacred Heart of Jesus, the Immaculate Conception, even the place of the Pope uh, in, in the administration of the Universal Church that many of their theologians now have really begun to change uh, their outlook and to come back to orthodox roots where uh, these, these uh, uh, dogmas of the Catholic Church are beginning to change. Well, Your Eminence, we thank you for your time today. Father thank Dimitrios, you. thank you as well. And I invite our guests to log on to youtube.com slash Greek Orthodox Church for more programs in this series called Discovering Orthodox Christianity. I'm Stacey Spanos. Thanks so much for watching.